I'm delighted to say that I've been joined by uh, Jamie Hen of 350.org. Uh, perhaps we should start off, Jamie, by uh, telling some of our viewers what 350 is. You bet. Good to see you all, uh, and congratulations on day one of opening up the talks with much. One Climate. Um, 350.org is a international campaign, mm -hmm. uh, and the number comes from 350 parts per million, which mm -hmm. is the safe upper limit of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We're now at 392 parts per million and seeing the impacts around the world, and so 350 is focused on building a grassroots movement that can push for bold and ambitious action. Okay. So you mentioned this this number three nine two that, that we're we're already past the safe level for for climate change. What are these impacts we're seeing around the world? Why is the climate crisis so urgent? Well, we're seeing all sorts of impacts around the world. I mean, twenty. 11 has really been a showcase of what climate change is going to look like more and more as we go forward if we don't take action. Uh, there's been terrible flooding in large parts of the world. We remember what happened in Pakistan last year and then we've seen continued flooding in Central America and Asia. Actually just a couple days ago here in Durban, eight people lost their lives because of record flooding here in the city, uh, which is a poignant reminder for folks here at the talks. We're also seeing lots of fires in places where there is increased drought. Uh, in the U.S., where I come from, in the Southwest and in Texas, there are incredible incredible fires this year, so much so that the head of the uh, Texas firefighters said that no human had ever fought fires that extreme on the earth before, which is a sign that we're really into a new type of planet, that climate change has fundamentally altered the way not only our atmosphere works, but the natural systems, and that we're facing severe impacts right now. So a lot of people are saying, including ourselves, that if this is the world at 392, uh, then what's going to happen if we crank up the dial in terms of the amount of carbon in the atmosphere to 450, 500, 700 parts per million? Um, those impacts will continue to amplify. Uh, and I think that as many of the African nations and island nations are saying here, we're already at the brink and that our survival really depends on actively reducing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, not continuing or not really delaying this process for another 10, 15, 20 years down the road. 350 uh, as an organization has taken its its name after kind of a, a bit of science really. It is kind of, it's inspired by the science. So can I just ask you, what's the status of the science? You know, you'd think that if the science was solid, we'd have seen action. Where are we at? Well, you said inspired by the science. It's often more grim kind of looking at the science, uh, but inspired by the possibility of reaching what science says is necessary. Um, it's a great question. I mean, in, in a rational world, when your top scientists for every government out there and the International Panel on Climate Change says you need to take action or maybe the end of the planet as we know it and devastating impacts will affect millions of people around the world, that should be enough to convince governments to do the right thing. Clearly it's not. And I think we all know many of the reasons why, one of the largest being that our governments still are completely controlled often by the interests of the fossil fuel industry. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's campaign contributions or active lobbying or the type of influence that we're seeing here at the talks where members of oil companies, for example, are on delegations oftentimes mm -hmm. from Canada and other places. Um, that's the type of influence that we haven't been able to break yet. And mm -hmm. it's exactly why we need more of a powerful citizens movement to challenge the fossil fuel industry and help kind of break the grasp a stranglehold that they have on our governments. Mm -hmm. um, those prime, changing those primary conditions is what it's going to take to get a real result out of the UNFCCC. So we're eager for what progress we can make here in Durban, but recognize that until we can build a stronger movement to really tip the balance back at home in term of, terms of the power the fossil fuel industry has, uh, we're unlikely to see the type of ambitious action that science requires. Okay, and you, you mentioned the need for ambitious action and the, and the need for, for building a movement. Now, you've been working hard at that. What's the, I know, we've been working for years. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the good news is that it really has been building. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 350 first arrived at the talks uh, in, in Bali mm -hmm. when we sort of started this road towards Copenhagen and then afterwards and, and really built around Copenhagen. And so there was an incredible outpouring around Copenhagen. I mean, we think of the talks as a failure in many ways, and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that Copenhagen was as a success is kind of launching more of a global grassroots movement around climate change. Um, that movement has continued to grow in amazing ways. Um, grow in the sense that it's expanded to countries where there never was a grassroots climate movement before. There's incredible youth activists here from countries across Africa, but also places like uh, Vietnam and Cambodia, places that hadn't really seen a grassroots climate movement uh, focused on this crisis, but now is exploding and having incredible actions and, and success. 
At the same time, it's gotten stronger in key places. Um, we had a big victory in the United States this year around this Keystone XL pipeline. We haven't seen victories like that on climate uh, before in serious ways. And so I think that we're way behind. I mean, we should have built this thing 20 years ago, uh, mm -hmm. but we're, we're beginning to catch up and beginning to create the type of pressure necessary to start influencing decisions. Um, so I'd say, you know, it is a constant refrain that we need a larger, larger movement, and it, it will be a constant refrain for many years. I think mm -hmm. it, it will take us a while to get there. Um, hopefully, it's, you know, it's kind of a race against the clock, and, and hopefully we'll be able to build the type of pressure we need to, to help pull our governments back from fossil fuel companies and start listening to people uh, in time enough to make the kind of changes that we need to see. Mm -hmm. And you, you mentioned this, uh, this big win that the 350s had campaigning against the XL pipeline in, in the United States. Can you tell, uh, just tell us a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So as, as way of background, um, there was a proposal to build uh, a pipeline from the Canadian tar sands, which are in Alberta, Canada. Mm -hmm. It's some of the dirtiest fuel on the face of the planet, mm -hmm. um, down across the Midwest of the United States to the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. And the hope was that this pipeline would help uh, oil companies in Canada really maximize and boost up tar sands production. Mm -hmm. um, for a while, this stuff hadn't been produced because it was just too expensive to do it. Mm -hmm. But as the oil prices went up, it became viable to kind of really begin to exploit this resource. The interesting thing about the tar sands is it's land Landlocked. Mm -hmm. They can't get the oil out of there unless they start building some new massive pipelines. So Keystone XL really was a key piece of in infrastructure um, for them to expand the tar sands and for us to really help shut it down. Um, so this proposal looked like uh, it was going to go through. Uh, every insider said there was no chance it would be stopped, that this thing had been set up from the start. Uh, and the oil company, TransCanada, that was proposing the pipeline had done everything that an oil company does to make sure it happens. They'd, uh, they would hired lobbyists, they hired Hillary Clinton's former campaign manager, mm -hmm. uh, and, and not because he was an expert on pipelines, but because they helped hoped he could influence the Secretary of State. Uh, they actually recommended the company that did the environmental impact statement for the pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, clearly, the statement said there is no environmental impact for a 1,700-mile pipeline, which is mm -hmm. ludicrous. Um, but there was an incredible movement that sprung up across the United States and Canada, really first with indigenous peoples in Canada who were feeling the impacts of climate or feeling the impacts of the mining then uh, ranchers and farmers in places like Nebraska and Texas not usually your hotbeds of environmental activism but they stood up and said we don't want this pipeline running through our backyards um, and in August over 1,000 people were arrested at the White House as part of a campaign that 350 and many others were really active in organizing um, and that transformed this pipeline into a national issue Fast forward a few months later, uh, 12,000 people came back to Washington, D.C. just a few weeks ago, actually, to surround the White House mm -hmm. and show President Obama that he had the support he needs to stand up and deny the permit the pipeline needed to be built. Uh, and he basically did so. He didn't do so in the way that we would want. You know, we were hoping he would come out and really be strong in it. Um, but in the political conditions that he's facing, he did as much as he really could, which was to kick back the pipeline for another review that will delay it for another 12 months. Most analysts say that would effectively kill the project. Even if it doesn't, I think there now is a movement that's really come up that could stop this thing on the ground if they had to. Um, so it was a real victory. I mean, it was a real chance to show that by framing this fight as one of people against polluters, of a grassroots movement taking on the fossil fuel industry, and really being clear about the implications for climate, um, we can have some serious victories. So I think for 350, there's a, there's a lesson in there, which is that we need to continue to talk about the real players that are holding back progress, like the fossil fuel industry, and continue to really double down on the type of grassroots actions and mobilizations that can make a difference. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you a little bit about the, the, the politics of the situation sure. in the US. What, you know, what's happening there? We've got an election coming up. Yeah. Obama's just delayed this pipeline, but at the same time, it seems to be terribly difficult to get any kind of real sense of progress when it comes to climate change. How do you, how do you see the situation in the US? Yeah, no, I mean, it's a tough question. I mean, there, U.S. politics is a pendulum shift, right? I mean, we swung all the way to George Bush, and then we swung back to Obama, which maybe wasn't quite as radical a shift as people had hoped, but but it kind of publicly it felt like that. I mean, let alone Obama the man, the spirit of that election was so radically different from what had been happening in the U.S. just a couple years before um, that it, it felt transformative in many ways. It was, at least for the public discourse. Um, I think we're beginning to see a shift like that again hopefully. Um, you're seeing it in the Occupy movements that are taking place across the U.S. We finally caught up with everybody that was doing actions in Barcelona and elsewhere before. Um, but that movement really is real. I mean, I, I've been at the occupations in, in different cities and, and took part of the one in Oakland, where I'm from in California. Um, and there's a real spirit there that, you know, is not focused on one single campaign, but is a kind of a manifestation of the raw energy that's out there in the U.S. right now. Um, I think that you're going to see Obama 
run harder on some of the messages that we want him to. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Republicans have clearly overstepped on climate denial. Mm -hmm. um, the U.S. public isn't with them when it comes to polling. Uh, there are certainly lots of deniers in the U.S. We're a big country. We have tens of millions of deniers, likely. Um, but they're still not as influential as the mainstream public that I think really does want to see action, mm -hmm. at the very least, on investing in clean energy, which is, has record highs in terms of public support. Um, so I think you're going to see this campaign come out and campaign strong against fossil fuel companies, campaign strong against oil industry, um, and really stand up, hopefully, for the type of investments we need to get the economy back on track again and deal with the climate crisis. Will it be enough? Certainly not. Uh, mm -hmm. This is not a radical administration that's going to do what's necessary uh, when it comes to climate. And radical being, of course, just listening to science and doing what any reasonable person would do. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a chance to really shape this election as a mandate on the need to take on the fossil fuel industry mm -hmm. and invest in climate. So we'll see. I think that you know, U.S. politics is a hard thing to read in many ways, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm naturally sort of optimistic in general. Um, but I think that there's a real chance this go around to, to push hard, um, not just on Republicans, but really on Democrats as well, to say, you know, if you're in bed with the fossil fuel industry, you're not representing the views of your constituents, and that we're really going to push back and hold you accountable. And I think that we've demonstrated with this Keystone fight that there's some new grassroots muscle to really be able to do that. And do you think that this might represent an opportunity for Obama to kind of reconnect with his base, if you like, because, it, you know, the first time around when Obama came in, there was such a, a, a huge uh, a, a kind of tide of support with him, this, this real uh, feeling that change was on the horizon. And he seems to have underwhelmed, and, and certainly from talking to people in the US, there's, there's a, a sense that he's underwhelmed. I actually read a, um, a report online a few days ago saying that when it comes to environmental legislation, he's comparable with Bush right. in terms of his, his, his successes and failures. Um, is this an opportunity for him to really you know, reconnect and re-energize his base, do you think? I think it's, I mean, it's, it's not just an opportunity, it's a necessity. I mean, the, these guys can't win if they don't electrify their base a little bit more. And the type of base that they need to get, young people, people of color, women, those are the groups that have the strongest support for clean energy legislation and action on climate change. So there, I think there, you'll see a move uh, from the campaign to really begin to tilt in that direction. Um, and it's a good thing. I mean, it's, it's a good thing to get Obama reelected, uh, but a good thing to really fire up a movement that can take on different fights at the state level, that can take on fights at the national level, and hopefully begin to course correct the U.S. a little bit at the international talks. What I keep telling our international colleagues is, you know, continue to kind of isolate the U.S. here. Uh, we need the international community to move on without the United States. We need to maintain the legal frameworks that we do have in place. And, you know, it's a waiting game in some senses. We're, we're moving as fast as we can in the U.S. to try and change the political conditions. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're finally embracing the type of more confrontational tactics that are needed to do so. Um, and I think that we've shown the Obama campaign that there is a movement there that they can tap into. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the next six months will be really interesting. I mean, I'm eager to see it. Uh, I've, you know... Uh, We've gone back and forth on Obama many times, uh, but I feel the same way that he, his only chance of really living up to the expectations of the movement that put him into office in 2008 is to come out stronger on these issues. And it's, it's nice to hear some, some positive messaging and, and, and the notion that it's all to play for still and there's hope out there, but why hasn't this happened sooner? Where, you know, why has progress been so slow over the last kind of 20, 30 years? You're saying we should have had this movement. Is it, does the fault lie with, with organizations like 350, with, with the, the kinds of mobilization that we've been trying to make? Or is it a, a different, what's yeah, gone I mean, wrong? I mean, it's easier to look in the rear view mirror and I think play the blame game and stuff. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, it, in many ways there is a fault for folks who, you know, organizations or otherwise who weren't able to build up the kind of public movement we needed. And whether that's a strategic fault or a messaging thing, I mean, I think there's a debate and it's useful to look back at those failures and see what lessons we can learn. Look, I mean, the real fault lies in the fact that there is the most richest and profitable industries on earth that have made more money than any companies in the history of money mm -hmm. and are spending it to block any type of possible movement on climate change. Mm -hmm. um, you cannot get around that fundamental fact. And I think we like to say, well, we can create a clean energy economy or we can get climate legislation without really challenging these industries. Um, you know, we like to do positive messaging. We like to really hope that just the idea of stopping the climate crisis and investing in this new sustainable economy is enough to get real action. It should be. But with these incredibly powerful players standing in the way, we do need to get a little bit more confrontational with them and, and take the fight to them, whether that's a, a large act of civil disobedience like we did around the pipeline or a really strategic campaign in swing states to push back on politicians that accept money from fossil fuel companies. Mm -hmm. um, we're beginning to do that. I think that the climate movement is getting more political in the ways that will make a difference. Um, it's a shame that it hadn't happened before. Um, I think that it was perhaps a bit naive to think that you couldn't 
um, that you could create change without really taking on these guys. Uh, but that's happening in, in major ways, and I think that we're beginning to catch up um, without losing the fundamental idea that this transition is about uh, the promise of finally having a, a pathway of development that can be sustainable and that can really bring a lot of people out of poverty and begin to create the type of equitable society that we need. Um, so without losing sight of that vision, I think really being honest about the forces that stand in the way of achieving it mm -hmm. is going to be really key going forward. And I have just two more questions before we wrap up. The, the first is, um, what's in the future now for, for organizations like 350? If there's been this recognition that um, kind of more confrontational campaigning is necessary and we've seen kind of a mass direct action um, being led by senior figures from 350, um, is this going to become kind of more of the norm, do you think? I hope so. I mean, I think that I think we need both, right? I mean, it, it can't just be this kind of uh, anti-pipeline, anti-this and that movement. I think we need to still be positive and put forward a scenario that it, it grabs people and captures their imagination. Um, and there's incredibly cool work with like community-funded solar projects and rural energy systems and think, rethinking the way we run the grid. That stuff is key. And if, if that's what attracts people, then keep working on it. Um, but, you know, we do need more of a grassroots army that can take on these larger fights as well. And so I think we're going to be working on, on both sides of that equation, but putting a little bit more juice towards the type of actions that take on the industry that are necessary. Um, so uh, that's certainly a pathway 350 is going. Um, okay. We're looking to do that in the U.S. and internationally. I think you'll see the same thing from obviously groups like Greenpeace, but also groups like the Sierra Club and others who traditionally in the U.S. at least haven't been very confrontational, but will do more. Um, and again, we're catching up with movements in, in the U.K. that have done this over Heathrow and everything else. Uh, and, you know, a lot of movements on the ground to places here in Africa that have always recognize that this is a fight for survival um, and, and taking on the industry. We've talked with activists from Nigeria uh, to here in South Africa, who obviously have a history of uh, movement building culture and recognizing the need for that. So I think that we'll, we'll see more of that movement coming up. But, you know, it's, it's going to be hard and uh, there's no guarantees. But I think that we're beginning to see the, in, the inklings of it in, in fights like Keystone XL in the U.S. and then all the other work that's been happening internationally as well. Just finally, Jamie, we talked there about the importance of capturing the imagination, which brings me back to the to the UN. Um, <laughs> not the easiest place to be not engaging people with that. Well, what, what's 350 uh, doing here? What are you looking to achieve here? Sure. Well, I mean, a couple things. It, it's always great to come to these meetings for what happens outside of the official talks as well as inside. So mm -hmm. outside, we're doing a lot of work with uh, young African activists. We have a fantastic song that was created by musicians across Africa and global hip-hop artists. It's called People Power, which seems to be fitting with the theme I keep hammering on. Um, so there's a lot of outside work to just continue to strengthen this movement, make those ties that will help our work going forward. Inside the talks, uh, the push is continuing to support the island nations and other vulnerable countries which are speaking the truth about the science and the survive, their survival that depends on it. Um, make sure that we're not getting uh, dragged into some long timeline where we think we can have a treaty in 2020 and, you know, if we wait that long to peak emissions, we really don't have a chance of getting back to 350. Um, and continuing to emphasize that we cannot see the transformational change we need here in the UNFCCC without really uh, reforming our political systems back at home as well. And, and challenging that corporate power. So as much as we're focused on the talks, we hope for a successful outcome in Durban. We hope that it maintains the legal instruments we do have to really make an impact. Uh, a lot of what I'm doing is going around with people and saying, all right, in, in two weeks from now, how do we get back to work back at home and really uh, challenge the industries that are standing in the way? Well, we'll look forward to seeing how that uh, plays out in the year to come, Jamie. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to uh, go to a, a video now, um, that interview with uh, uh, Georgina that I mentioned earlier, um, and uh, we'll be back with you shortly.